A civilization, to simply put, is a cultural entity. And a nation, as I just said, is not simply cultural, it's political cultural. It's a political community with a distinct cultural dimension. Right? One of the best ways to illustrate this point is to look at the great debates that took place at the turn of the 20th century. Late, 19, late, 18, late uh, 19th century, 1880s, 1890s, early 20th century, about whether India was a nation or could be a nation. The British argued for a long time that India was a civilization, not a nation. And one of the best examples of that view is a view by John Strachey, a leading uh, a, a senior British administrator in the 1880s, and in 1888 he wrote this famous passage quoted again and again and again in later scholarship and also administrative formulations. There is not and never was in India or even any country of India possessing according to any European ideas any sort of unity, physical, political, social or religious and that men of the Punjab, Bengal, the northwestern provinces, Madras should ever feel that they belong to one Indian nation is impossible. You might with as much reason and probability look forward to a time when a single nation will have taken the place of the various nations of Europe. A profound thought. The claim here is that India like Europe is a civilization. Just as Europe has 20 odd nations, India, when it became independent, whenever that happened, would have 20, 30, 40 nations. They would all say that they were part of Indian civilization, but they would be different nations. Here is Mark Twain. This is from my recent book where I've used these arguments or examples. Mark Twain, a literary giant of modern times, undoubtedly a literary giant with great, great insights and reflections on, on certain, not only America, but many parts of the world. So M Twain traveled in India in 1895-96. Um, in 96. And uh, as, you, as, you, as I read this, you'll see he was filled with admiration for India. But he was very pessimistic about Indian nationhood. India had the first civilization. She had the first accumulation of material wealth. She was populous with deep thinkers and subtle intellects. It would seem as if she should have kept the lead and should be today not the meek dependent of an alien master, namely the British. But in truth, there was never any possibility of such supremacy for her. If there had been but one India and one language late 19th century argument about language and nationhood. One India and one language, but there were 80 of them. When there are 80 nations and several hundred governments fighting and quarreling must be the common business of life, unity of purpose and policy are impossible, patriotism cannot, can have no healthy growth. So there's an argument about the civilizational brilliance of India, but it's national impossibility. Right? This is the challenge, and this is the last uh, part, uh, last uh, unit of, of this, this, this particular lecture. This is a challenge that Gandhi accepted, and he, if you read him carefully, and you use modern day language, he was essentially trying to turn a civilization into a nation, generating patriotism and unity of purpose, the freedom movement under Gandhi's leadership accepted as its own the challenge of turning India into a nation. And the idea, the basic idea that was used was unity in diversity. What does that mean? This huge political project through which freedom movement through which India was constructed, that essentially in today's language means that Indians had to have a hyphenated identity. They would not be like Europeans, one language leading to one nation, but India would be multilingual. A second India was, 
was too diverse to be turned into an undifferentiated monolingual entity. India would be multilingual, but a second layer of identity would be created, and that would be called Indian identity, not just civilizational, but national identity. So Indians would be Gujarati Indians, Bengali Indians, Muslim Indians, Hindu Indians, not undifferentiated monolingual Indians. And Gandhi argued, if you read, he has 99 volumes of his collected works, he had maniacal energy, wrote all the time, spoke all the time. Um, if you go through some of the writings, he's basically saying that a one language, one nation formula would undermine India, not build India. Undermine India, not build India, if, if India is to turn into a nation, right? So, uh, the delinking of language and nationhood leads to a radical formulation in Gandhi. He uh, even argues that English could be seen as an Indian language. In 1919, in a famous statement, this is what he said, I do not want my house to be walled in on all sides. And my windows to be stuffed, I want the cultures of all the lands to be blown about my house as freely as possible, but I refuse to be blown off my feet by any. In today's language, this is cosmopolitan patriotism. Let English also come. Why should Shakespeare be called simply a part of English or British civilization? Shakespeare is part of world civilization. Science written in English is part of world civilization. There's a lot that we can learn from the world. But in the process of learning, we shouldn't uproot ourselves. We should remain rooted. We can combine the two. Similarly, he delinked religion and nationhood. That is very well known, argued that it, India is not simply a Hindu nation. India is a nation for all. That is very well known. But another radical formulation that he came up with, which deracialized the conception of nation. Some, some people, for example, Golwalkar was arguing that India was a race. If you read him, we or our nationhood defined, he was talking about India as a race, and India as a race was the Hindu race. Right? Um, as early as 1909, 1906, 1907, Gandhi came up with this idea that the, even the English did not have to leave India. It is not necessary for us to have as our goal the expulsion of the English. If English become Indianized, we can accommodate them. All they have to do is give up their arrogance. And condescension, if they accept Indian culture, they become Indianized, they can be part of the Indian nation. They don't have to leave. Right? So this is the difference between civilization and nation. Right? Gandhi, Gandhi used these ideas, and he was undoubtedly the leader of the freedom movement. All others contributed meaningfully, substantially, but no one more than Gandhi. Hmm? Both in terms of mobilizational ideas and tactics and ideas about what this nation was going to be all about. This is also by Donald Horowitz, um, master concept maker in the field. What is a dispersed ethnic system and what is a centralized ethnic system? A dispersed ethnic, uh, uh, this is, uh, 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 a dispersed ethnic system is one where ethnicities are locally based and there are many ethnic identities, many ethnicities. Centralized systems or centrally focused systems are those which have very few salient ethnic identities that, uh, which in, moreover have nationwide resonance. Example, Sri Lanka is widely viewed as a centrally focused system. Essentially, there were two identities, or three, which became two, and now it's three again. Just three identities, the whole island. At least three salient identities. I'm sure there are many others. Right? So, Sinhala identity, Tamil identity, and now increasingly Muslim identity. Earlier on, it was Sinhala identity, Tamil plantation identity, and Jaffna Tamil identity. Hmm? These, when conflicts arise in such systems, the reason this, import, this is important, when conflicts arise in the system, they go through the length and breadth of the whole country, 
they create existential threats to the nation. Conflicts escalate in such systems. East Pakistan, West Pakistan, same problem. Very few identities in Pakistan that were salient. Four you could say in, in, in West Pakistan, Punjabi, Sindhi, um, Pathan and Baluchi and then a Bengali identity. So linguistically five, religiously one, right? Or unless you start separating, talking about, talk about different versions of Islam, Sufi and more modernists, etc., etc. So very, very few identities. Is India in this literature a centrally focused, a centralized ethnic system or, dis or dispersed ethnic system? Dispersed. Each language group of India has a home of its own, major language group. Right? So linguistic conflict typically doesn't grip the whole country. What about religious cleavages? The Hindu Sikh cleavage is confined basically to Punjab. Hmm? Hindu Muslim cleavage, does it make a difference to places or does it become very violent south of Hyderabad? Bangalore, there have been some riots, but south of Hyderabad, basically no. Can change? We, not, we don't know. Right? Um, um, caste system is a classic dispersed ethnic system. There are, there are, caste system is national in principle, but local or regional in experience. In dispersed systems, conflicts tend to get bottled up in a certain region, in certain locations. They don't spread nationally. They, dispersed systems might have many more conflicts because there are so many identities, but no conflicts typically, typically, there would be exceptions. These are average statements, right? These are aggregate or average statements. In, in dispersed ethnic systems, they are linguistically different. Yes? They are religiously different. Yes? Tamils are Hindus, mostly. Mostly. And Singhala people, mostly Buddhist. I did study a community called Nigambo, 60 kilometers from Colombo, where most Tamils and Singhala people were Catholic Christians. That's the only exception we know. Otherwise, Singhala, most Singhala people, and predominant, preponderant proportion would be Buddhist and, and would speak Singhala. A preponderant proportion of Tamils would be Hindu and they would speak Tamil and, and racially most people would argue racially also distinct. Compare that to a typical Indian Muslim. Depending on where she is, her language is likely to be Urdu everywhere. Her language could be Malayalam, her language could be Tamil, her language could be Bengali. How many Bengali Muslims have you heard speaking Urdu? Or how many Tamil Muslims have you heard speaking Urdu? Right? I, I, I've heard a lot of Bangalore Muslims I've met who, who try to speak Urdu. I'm not, I'm not denying that. But it's not clear to me that Muslims outside Bangalore are, are Urdu speakers. or would like to be Urdu speakers. Right? Rural Muslims of Gujarat, do they speak Gujarati or Urdu? Right? So depending on where you are located as a Muslim, you would speak a different language, which means religion and language cross-cut do not accumulate. Right? So you could find only some groups in India where you would get cumulation. In fact, later on we'll, we'll see whether where there are cumulative cleavages, the problem of ethnic conflict has been much more serious. In fact, most insurgencies in India have, have erupted in areas of cumulative cleavage structure, not areas of cross-cutting structure, a thought for later. Hmm? But, um, but on the whole, you, India is an example of cross-cutting identities, Sri Lanka an example of cumulative identities, South Africa was an example of cumulative identities, right? And the claim here is that when conflict breaks out in a cumulative identity structure is much more murderous, dangerous 
and can cause existential threats. But conflict, but cross-cutting cleavages tend to dampen conflict. Escalation, rates of escalation are lower or the very quality of escalation might be missing. They don't cross a threshold. Right? Once again in this literature it is argued that India, or certainly after 1947, has not faced existential threats the way, for example, Pakistan has, the way, for example, Sri Lanka has, right? the way, for example, Burundi and Rwanda did. Right? So India, in a way, you can say India, given India's, the way India's diversity gets expressed, it's neither, neither centralized nor cumulative. As a result of which, in the ethnicity literature, India, of course, is widely studied, but no conflict of India, with the partial exception of Hindu-Muslim conflict, once again, to be discussed later at some length, with the partial exception of Hindu-Muslim conflict, no conflict of India generates the kind of existential anxiety, a mortal threat to the nation, the way tamil Sinhala conflict in India did, right? The way... Tamil, uh, in, in Sri Lanka did, the way Malay-Chinese conflict in Malaysia did right until the late 1960s.